Good morning and welcome to session eight of OBWB's Source Water Protection Webinar Series. Today we'll be talking about using mapping to understand and manage risks to drinking water. So I'd like to acknowledge that I'm hosting this webinar on the traditional unceded territory of the Silk Okanagan people. I encourage you to take a moment to think about and acknowledge the traditional territories you are joining from as well. And as I've said in previous weeks, I truly believe that water provides opportunities for reconciliation. And as water suppliers and local governments, we're in a, a unique and important role uh, in building positive relationships and partnerships with Indigenous communities whose traditional territories we are operating in. And source protection processes are strengthened if you can include Indigenous values, knowledge, and leadership from the very beginning. So format today, quick intro from me. Those of you who have been to all of the webinars are, are familiar with this introduction. So I make it quick, but if you've never attended one, this will be important information for you. And then we'll get to hear from three panelists, one from UBC Okanagan, one from Natural Resources Canada, and another from a local consulting company. And then we'll end with Q&A. Housekeeping items. As you know, webinars are recorded and posted on the Source Water Protection Toolkit website. If you're a part of PIBC or EOCP, you can get training credits for these webinars. And I encourage you to submit your questions anytime during the webinar using the Q&A feature. So not the chat feature, but the Q&A. And we'll have a designated time at the end of the webinar to answer your questions. A big thank you to all of the people who are involved in this toolkit project and organizing these webinars. We had the technical advisory committee that included people from almost all of the local governments throughout the Okanagan, um, from the provincial government and federal government, from health agencies, First Nations groups, and academia and local water experts and consultants. We had funding from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs, Interior Health, City of Kelowna, City of West Kelowna, and the OBWB, and also most recently through the Healthy Watersheds Initiative. Toolkit authors were Lorette Aquatic Consulting, Heather Lorette and Jamie, who's actually here today as one of the speakers. And then uh, we had Casey who helped coordinate these webinars. So next week we have our webinar on monitoring and reporting. So this is a, a great webinar that will tie together a lot of the concepts from the previous webinars. It talks about the key elements of data collection and monitoring programs and why they are important. And um, we'll hear about an, an initiative being completed by Living Lakes Canada that's making water data readily available to those who need it. So here's the toolkit for those of you who haven't seen it. It's available as a download PDF at sourcewaterprotectiontoolkit.ca and all of its contents have been transferred to actually a, web, a website. So you can um, download that PDF and then cruise through the website to see all of these different parts of the toolkit. The first part, part one, is designed to simplify and clarify the source protection planning process. So it boils it down to five steps for water suppliers to follow in order to have those source water protection plans completed and carried out. Part two is the tools, and that's what these webinars have focused on, are these tools in the toolkit. And then part three is a whole bunch of additional info and resources that really dives into some of the concepts that are presented in part one and part two. Uh, it has a whole bunch of useful links and then some templates for source water protection assessments and plans. So here is what the roadmap source protection looks, which is part looks like, which is part one of the toolkit, those five steps and how they relate to the tools in the toolkit. And then on the far right, these are the different webinar sessions that um, covered these tools. So again, you can go onto the website and listen to the recordings if you weren't able to attend the webinars. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but we can't see your screen. Um, okay. Thank you for interrupting. I wish somebody had done it sooner. <laughs> okay. Okay, so... Um, can you see it now? Yep, all good. Okay, okay thanks very much. Um, I think I'm just gonna keep going because I know a lot of people who are on the webinar have attended in previous weeks anyways. Okay, so next slide. So today we're focusing on tool seven, which is the mapping tool. 
And the key messages in the toolkit about this tool is that mapping is a powerful tool to visualize geographic patterns, identify risks, and plan future land use activities. And again, there are high quality publicly available geospatial data um, that can be used for source water protection. And the toolkit provides descriptions and links to these data. So let's get into our presentations. So we have three panelists today. So first, Jamie. Jamie is an aquatic biologist with Lorette Aquatic Consulting and authored, he actually authored the mapping section in the toolkit. He has experience in drinking water quality, municipal drinking water systems, data management, R, GIS, statistical analysis, reservoir management, and water monitoring program design and implementation. And he's actually joining us from Australia where it's very early in the morning tomorrow. And then we've got Brian. He's a cumulative effects research scientist at Natural Resources Canada's Great Lakes Forestry Centre. And he's actually joining us from Sault Ste. Marie. He's interested in the effects of landscape characteristics and spatial context on aquatic ecosystems. He completed his PhD at the University of British Columbia, studying the cumulative effects of headwater impairment on downstream ecosystem patterns and processes. And then finally, we'll have Matthew who is an assistant professor in the Department of Earth, Environmental and Geographic Sciences at UBC Okanagan and the lead of the Earth Observation and Spatial Ecology Lab. His research group works on various questions related to understanding changing landscapes, wildlife populations and ecological processes using satellite imagery, geospatial data and spatial modeling. So welcome to the panelists and I will invite Jamie to share his screen first. You can hear me still? Yes. Excellent. All right, so <clears throat> welcome to webinar on uh, tool number seven, mapping in the Source Water Protection Toolkit series. Uh, as Kelly mentioned, my name is Jamie Stealth. I am a registered professional biologist working with Laird Aquatic, and I've been doing this for 11, just about 11 years now, um, kind of specializing in uh, source water assessments and protection. Um, I think between myself and uh, Heather, uh, we've done uh, 22 source assessments in the Okanagan. So it's kind of something we're very passionate about and um, mapping is a very important part of that. Um, so I guess, why is mapping a very important part of that? Um, source water and source water protection is kind of an inherently geospatial concept. Things happen in the landscape and there are patterns and um, <clears throat> things that will show up on mapping in ways that perhaps just a simple graph wouldn't show. Um, so you can do things like vulnerability mapping, um, delineating source protection areas. All of those things lend themselves very well to mapping. Um, and mapping is uh, it's just an easy way to convey some of these things to a more non-technical audience. If you just show it on a map, people kind of intuitively understand. Um, and one of the, the good things about mapping is that it's shareable. So I can make a map and then I can share it to someone else and then they can include that in their systems and their analysis um, you know, very easily. It doesn't take any additional steps other than just loading it into their systems. Um, and mapping is very useful in presentations. If you just wanna you know, you throw up a map, here's the source protection area and people can immediately understand, oh yeah, well, that's where I live. And you know, that's the river near my house or whatever. It just, um, it just makes sense to a lot of people. Um, it's not a perfect situation for all um, circumstances. Uh, GIS does require some technical background and often a significant amount of computing resources. But if you have someone who you know, has some mapping background, then you can put that into play in your organization. Uh, as Kelly mentioned, there are many publicly available mapping tools and data sources um, that anyone can have access to. In addition to that, I know there's a lot of people in the, in the 
in the call here who are working with municipalities or government at some level. And I think almost all of them will have their own GIS systems of some variety. Um, here is just a table that is actually in the, uh, the toolkit, listing some of the, the specific mapping tools that are relevant in our neck of the woods in BC. Um, so kind of the first off the bat, we've got GOBC, which is a, a public portal where the provincial government of British Columbia shares all of their geospatial data. So you can go there and you can have access to pretty much anything you want. They've got layers for, you know, roads, waterways, forestry range, recreation, you know, all of these things that are very important from a source protection perspective. All of that data is just publicly available. Anyone can go and download it if you've got the, the software to open the files. And of course there are open open source GIS software that'll open it. All of it can be done for free. Um, <clears throat> Google Earth time-lapse. This one's been around for a little while. Um, it's pretty straightforward and I'm gonna demo it in a few minutes, but I think it's just super useful at visualizing change in a watershed. Um, Sentinel Hub Playground. This is a new one that I've come across in the last year or so. Um, but it uses near real-time satellite imagery. So whereas if you go to you know, Google Maps, it'll show you a, a perfect image from you don't know when. Sentinel Hub will tell you when, and it's usually any point in the world updated a couple times a week. So you can see what's going on almost in real time. And you can you know go back and forth over time. And I'm going to demo that one again too. Uh, this one's specific to the Okanagan. Our DCO hosts a website where you can look back and forth through their historical air photos archives, and you can compare two different time periods, and I'll demo that one. And this last one is new and very exciting from my perspective. The provincial government of BC has just launched their public LIDAR portal. So... Um, Previously, if you wanted LiDAR, uh, we were literally passing around a hard drive between people. Oh, it's my turn. I'll get the data and pass it off to the next person. Um, but now you can go to a publicly available website and you can see all of the data and download it straight from there. And I'll demo that as well. Uh, and here's another bunch of Okanagan specific data sources. These um, um, a lot of municipalities are now publishing their GIS layers using um, ArcGIS web tools. And so I'm certain that this is not necessarily only an Okanagan thing. I would imagine that municipalities all over the country uh, are using a similar system, but these are all of the municipalities in the Okanagan and web links for where you can go and access their GIS data. So you can include that in your source protection thing. So infrastructure and uh, if you wanted to know where a stormwater outfall is, because obviously that's very important from a source protection perspective. So you can grab that. Super useful. Again, all free. Uh, so here is just a quick demo of what the Google Earth time lapse looks like. So this is. Um, the North Okanagan, so you've got Kelowna here, and we'll just kind of play through. It starts in 1984 and runs to 2020, and you can just watch the change over time. So it's, it's easy to just kind of layer on top of this, the watershed or area of interest, and then you can just see, for instance, here's the Bear Creek, Lambley Creek watershed. So you can see the upper elevation area, significant amounts of logging, and that'll all be related to um, mountain pine beetle salvage. So after the mid 2000s, you can see that it'll just significant amounts of areas cleared just as salvage from mine, mountain pine beetle. Uh, 
And here is a demo of the RDCO historical images. So this is um, central Kelowna. Dilworth Mountain is right in the middle. So you can just kind of you go back and forth. So here's 1951. Kelowna doesn't really exist. Here's 2019. And you can go back and forth. And so this is great if you have a specific site in mind where you want to see how has it changed. You can literally slide back and forth and see. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that one's particularly useful in looking at um, comparing to a pre-urban landscape. So if you want to see what the natural landscape was uh, prior to urbanization. Here is an example from Sentinel Hub. And so this is Kelowna on Sunday. It's snowy. <laughs> a beautiful winter wonderland. And you've got all the different um, filters from the satellite so you can look at you know if you're interested in vegetation you can click to the infrared band if you're interested in you know various different things and then at the top here you've got just a calendar and you can just pick through and i mean you have no control over if it's cloudy <laughs> if it's cloudy then you're not going to see very much on that day but yeah this is super useful and uh, an example of how i use this in my work just this past year is on wood lake we suddenly noticed mm, there seems to be some algae accumulating on the shoreline. Uh, and so I looked it up and here's Wood Lake over the course of, what is that, a week? So on April 14th, the lake was clear. On April 17th, you can see suddenly the bloom has just exploded and there's algae visible throughout the lake. And by the 19th, the algae had kind of dispersed to the point where it was covering the whole lake. And that ended up uh, being a bit of a news item here in the Okanagan. This photo actually, I just made this and sent it to Lake Country and it ended up in the local news site. I was like, hey, I recognize that picture. So that's just another example of how mapping is very um, intuitive to the public. Just something you can very easily share and people will, will get it. Uh, here is the new LiDAR portal. So you kind of go there and it just starts off giving you a bunch of examples of things you can do with LiDAR data. Um, you, know, you can make 3D models, you can do terrain analysis, you can do all kinds of different things. LiDAR is great. <laughs> And um, then it jumps over into the mapping and download section. And this kind of shows you uh, all of the areas within the province where LIDAR has been done and is now available. And it's actually a lot. It's very impressive. <laughs> and you've got here over on the right side, the different types of LIDAR data. So they've got you know the raw point clouds, if that's your thing, or you can go to the pre-processed you know, digital elevation models. And this is just, you know, the layers available in the Okanagan, for instance. Uh, so those are kind of some of the, the tools that we've listed in the toolkit that are, you know, generally applicable across a wide range. Um, and I'm just gonna give two examples of ways that I've used some of these tools uh, for source water protection in the Okanagan. <clears throat> so first off, uh, a study that uh, we worked on in 2019-2020 was a source assessment and source protection plan for the Naramata drinking water intake in South Okanagan. And as part of that, we did a detailed GIS analysis of some upstream watershed areas. Um, and kind of the backstory is there was a, a washout in one of the watersheds in 2017. Uh, surprise, surprise, given what happened that year. And it continued to unravel for a couple of years afterwards. And so we were interested in seeing, are there any other uh, high risk spots within those watersheds that could be a problem? Um, so I used the OBWB LIDAR data, which we were just looking at. We used um, in a couple layers from uh, GOBC resource roads, uh, cut blocks, stream networks. And so the first layer of that analysis involved just kind of a identifying all of the points of crossing where 
uh, roads, trails, cross waterways, because that was the point of failure in this situation. It was um, a culvert that became blocked and and it saturated a slope and that failed. <clears throat> and then the second phase of the analysis involved uh, identifying recent logging cut blocks. So ones that were unlikely to have um, slope stabilizing regrowth uh, in high slope areas. And then comparing those two data sets to identify um, high risk areas. And so here's some maps that came out of that. The first panel is uh, the crossings. Second panel are the cut blocks. And then we created a heat map of where are these high risk areas. And so that kind of um, allowed them to focus where they were gonna work on their um, further investigations. Uh, and the second example, I've only got a couple minutes here. This is a watershed risk mapping that we've done for the city of West Kelowna. And so the goal of this study was um, to combine a bunch of different geospatial layers to create a cumulative risk assessment map for their upland watersheds. Um, <clears throat> and so we, we developed a GIS tool to do this. Um, it's important to note in this case that this is not a hydrological assessment. So we didn't, we weren't trying to determine what is the risk of any specific point having a failure. It was rather from the perspective of if something went wrong at any specific point in the watershed, what is the likelihood of a risk of something happening there negatively impacting source water? Uh, and so the data sets we used were uh, watershed boundaries, resource roads, stream networks, logging cut blocks, lakes, wetlands, um, LIDAR, dams, and um, city of West Kelowna infrastructure. Uh, so here is the result of that, where we took all of the different layers, we ranked, you know, the risk on a geographic basis for each layer using uh, this table here. And then you sum all those together and you get this map of the cumulative risk. Uh, and then you turn that into zones. And so you can see here how it turned out with the green was areas where if something happened, that would be a low risk to the intake versus the closer you get to the intake and down here, you know, it's very high risk. So if something happened, you know, right beside their, their intake, obviously there's no buffering left. Um, <clears throat> and from that, you can create uh, really nice visualizations like this one. So this is that same area. The intake is right here at the bottom. And you can see the perimeter of the, of the reservoir is high and very high risk. Something happens there, you know, you'll feel it at the intake. And then as you would move further up the watershed, um, it changes based on proximity to a number of factors. Uh, and that's the end of mine. Uh, I was one and a half minutes over. I'm sorry, Kelly. <laughs> I will stop sharing and pass it off to Brian. Thank you very much, Jamie. All right, thank you very much. Jamie, I can still see your slides. <clears throat> There we go. All right. I will open this up. And everyone can see my slides okay? Sure can. Okay, perfect. There you go, All looks right. good. All right, sounds good. I just have to figure out how to get this Zoom box out of my way. <laughs> okay, so, um, Thanks very much for the invitation uh, from Casey to present on some of my work um, that I've been doing with the Canadian Forest Service. Um, sorry, just making sure everything's going still. There we go. All right, so, um, so I'm a member of the Canadian Forest Service and uh, part of the work that we do is providing the science for decision makers um, to make decisions about things that, uh, like pest risk management, climate change, 
uh, forest management, wildfire risks, uh, cumulative effects, sustainable fiber solutions, and forest sector competitiveness. And uh, most of the work that we do is, is really meant to um, do our best to provide um, um, new science um, for making and informing those decisions that are made at, at higher levels. So I'm uh, coming to you from uh, just a short drive away. Um, if you don't know where Sault Ste. Marie is, it's at kind of the, the bottom end of uh, Lake Superior. And uh, so this is the view outside of my front window. Um, so we have a little bit of snow, but I heard that Kelowna also has a, a blizzard today. So that doesn't really mean that much anymore. Um, the pre-pandemic for about three months, um, I worked at the, I worked out of the Great Lakes Forestry Center. Um, and it's, it's one of six centers spread across Canada. Um, I'm just taking a chance to introduce our work a little bit more here. Um, so it's, uh, it, it originated as the, uh, the Forest Insect Laboratory in 1945, um, and it's contributed a lot to the science of understanding uh, pest management in, in Ontario and Canada. Um, and it's, it has since expanded to, um, to house members of the DFO um, and members of uh, an organization called the Invasive Species Centre. Um, and yeah, so there's a there's a lot of research that goes on outside of or in the Great Lakes Forestry Center specifically related to forest ecosystems and managing uh, and managing for managing forests. Um, a couple of interesting things about this specific uh, this specific center is that um, our one of our famous astronauts, uh, Roberta Bondar, grew up in Sault Ste. Marie, and she also worked uh, at the at the Bug Lab briefly. Um, and another cool thing is that uh, one of the six papers that were that were cited in Watson and Crick's uh, DNA work um, way back in the in the 60s, uh, one of one of those six papers that it cited actually came out of the out of the forest insect laboratory at the time. So that's kind of cool. Um, so I'm part of a, a lab called the the wet lab, the watershed ecology team um, out of the Great Lakes Forestry Center. And our, our goal is to provide, the, um, provide science for the responsible man management of Canada forests in order to, um, to really meet these kind of goals, which is to protect the productivity and functions of, of freshwater ecosystems, uh, maximize carbon sequestration, and at the same time, um, try and mitigate freshwater contamination, all related to, um, to, to forestry. There, the, the team is led by um, Dr. Eric Emelson, um, and we have a bunch of different visiting visiting students uh, and scientists, technicians in the lab, but these are just the smiling face, faces of the, the watershed ecology team at the, at the GLFC. And I'm a, I'm a postdoc um, term research scientist um, in the group. We mostly work on, um, well, kind of everything related to uh, forest and aquatic ecology and, and linking those things. So a lot of our work is uh, using using spatial analysis um, uh, on the landscape and then taking the water that we water that we collect and um, and try and understand what the what the properties of that water are uh, including the nutrients and metals within that water as well as trying to understand the complexity is of the organic matter or the organic matter materials that are that are in that water at the same time so a lot of our work is trying to figure out how to to relate things that are happening across scales so things that are happening on the landscape all the way to things that are happening um, within the taxonomy and within the organic uh, molecular structure of, of forested ecosystems my work is uh, related to cumulative effects, so I'm specifically looking at um, the, uh, the effects of uh, catchments, catchment disturbances, landscape context, and, and unmeasured spatial variation, so trying to figure out autocorrelation effects um, on mercury concentration in fish across Ontario's managed forests, which is just a, a huge region um, in Ontario, just Tens, tens of thousands of lakes um, in Ontario with, with many of them sampled for fish. So we're trying to come up with cumulative effects models that try and 
uh, investigate uh, what leads to changes in, in mercury concentration in fish from a landscape scale. Um, so I'm interested in what are the materials on the landscape and how are they delivered to the, to the recipient water bodies, um, the, the context of the lake. So uh, where does it fit? Are there other lakes above, um, above that lake? What are their properties? Are there streams that drain into the lake? That, that sort of thing. And then finally, um, trying to get an understanding of what variables um, or scales are we missing when we're relating these catchment characteristics to mercury concentration. Um, but along, along the way, um, I've developed a, a tool um, that can kind of help with uh, and shed some light on the catchment characteristics that, uh, that you can relate to the mercury concentration in fish um, or really any, any um, landscape characteristics related to um, the, some kind of aquatic ecosystem component in the recipient water body. So just to jump back and give uh, a little bit of background for people that aren't familiar, um, what's typically done in these kind of studies is that you have, um, uh, can, you, can you see my, uh, my mouse when I? Yes. Uh, open it? Okay. So yeah, so what we typically do in these studies is we take something where we have like a water body, which is this stream right here. We have a sampling site where we're taking measures of of aquatic ecosystems such as water quality or maybe organic matter decomposition. And then we know that there's this area called the watershed that drains into the, um, that drains into the individual sampling site. And so we call that the kind of the site, the site characteristics, the site watersheds. Um, and those landscape characteristics uh, within those watersheds are the things that we're hoping to describe in order um, to understand how something down here is affected by something up here. But then uh, when we think about these landscapes, they're actually very uh, peppered with tons of different land uses, um, disturbances, different types of, of, uh, of features on the landscape. So um, we take the, the fact that the watershed is here and we take some, some land cover categories like this. So maybe these are disturbances, for example, and, and these disturbances are happening here and here in, in the watershed. And meanwhile, the other, um, the other uh, part of the catchment is relatively low in disturbance. And, and then like many of us probably on this call, um, we want to be able to describe this landscape. So in order to describe this, um, should we be accounting for the fact that things are for these within watershed uh, patterns? And does it matter where disturbances are? Does it matter that this disturbance is located right next to the stream? Does it matter um, whether the disturbance is located farther away? And so we're trying to, so what we've developed is, is kind of a way of, of coming up with ways of describing the landscape slightly differently um, to account for these, uh, the fact that things are, are might be farther away from the samplings, the sampling sites. Um, so I took some research that was developed um, out of Australia um, and and was really inspired by this by this work. Um, and it was specifically looking at um, inverse distance weighting some of the landscape characteristics uh, using a couple of different methods that I'm going to go through shortly. Um, to really like change the way that you that you're looking at the landscape. Um, so the idea is that this is an this is an R package that uses some software called Weightbox Tools, and um, the idea is that you take that landscape um, uh, right here and that you you break it apart into the individual pixels within that landscape, um, and it's divided up by the di digital elevation model that was used to generate that watershed. Um, and what you do is you, you use the use distance relationships to weight the individual contribution of, of these landscape cells. So it tends to be that the farther and farther away you get from a feature on the landscape, like a stream or a, or a sampling site, that the, the weight of that landscape cell um, or the, the influence of that landscape cell relative to that site or stream um, might go down so that the contribution of that, that individual cell. So that's the first function. And then the other function is when you add in different uh, landscape layers. So you use those weights and add in landscape layers like 
NDVI or uh, urban cover, and you calculate these different ways of looking at the landscape um, for various characteristics of interest. So I'm going to just run through a couple, some quick examples, and kind of show you what and how meaningful that actually could be. So let's imagine that we're sampling water quality at the sampling site and we have these disturbance values. And let's think about the classic way that we would um, evaluate this landscape. So if we took the mean of the area that's attributed to site number or these disturbances two, and the area that's attributed here, and we calculated the mean of those based on the area, you might end up with a mean that is equal to 1.05. So it's a little bit pulled over to two. If you looked at the percent composition of these two things, 95% um, of the coverage is in category one and 5% of the coverage is in category two. Now you, you might want to ask yourself, okay, is the disturbance um, that we're trying to capture, is the, process, is the process that we're trying to capture better described by straight line distances or is it better described by, um, by flow path distances? So, if you're thinking about straight line distances, you might be imagining something like blowing leaves. So does it matter? So, so yeah, like looking at this, this site is closer to, to this site. And so it's in kind of a lighter blue. And so that's weighted more, that area is weighted more heavily just based on straight line distances. And then you could imagine something on the landscape like leaching, like leaves actually hitting on, hitting the ground and then water hits the leaves and leaches nutrients out of that. And through various flow paths um, on the landscape, it makes its way into the stream. So these aren't these don't look that different, but you can kind of see a region around here that, that seems like it's more hydrologically connected to, to that site. So if we were to calculate those things based on uh, the straight line distance to the sampling point and the straight line distance to the stream, we end up with slightly different ways of looking at the landscape. So the mean calculated now would be 1.07, not that different. The percent coverage isn't, isn't that different either. So it's 93% of the of category one and then 7% of category two. And similarly, we, would, we might be interested in looking at the, the straight line distance to um, the water feature. So the actual stream itself. So if you calculate that again, um, using hydro weight and hydro weight attributes, um, then you would end up with a mean of 1.09. So, and the proportions are slightly different again. So you can see that depending on, depending on the landscape a little bit, um, is, is you can end up with slightly different ways of looking at the landscape or getting different characteristics here. So then let's look at the flow distance to the site. So the, the brighter pixels here are more are more connected to the site. So you expect the, the mean might be a little bit higher again. The, and then these are, again, like kind of similar across these areas. And that's mostly a function of, of this catchment just being very small. But again, there's kind of these, you can see that these areas right here are a little bit more connected. So this disturbance is likely, um, is contributing more to the mean of, of disturbances uh, of altogether. And then you end up with, with a slightly higher mean there. So it's really, it's really meant to, um, to be a tool to describe landscapes differently. Now, these all seem to be like fairly close in, in their statistics that have been generated from them in terms of disturbance values. But when it really gets interesting is when you start looking at these preferential flow paths. So this is taking into account the, the flow accumulation. So the individual flow, or the connections on the landscape that link directly to the sampling site or link directly to the stream. And this is where the statistics might change uh, and be very different depending on, the, um, depending on the watershed. So in this case, the mean has jumped up um, to a 1.25. So, so that's saying that this catchment is actually uh, more disturbed. And that's because this uh, this site right along along the stream pathway is actually disturbed very heavily and it's more influential to that downstream downstream point. It's right on the preferential flow path. Similarly, um, the this site right here is is at a is at a point in the watershed that is right when it enters into that stream. So it has a very high, likely has a very high influence on on the on the sampling site 
assuming that water just like flows right down to the sampling site too. So you can see that the, the interpretation of these watershed characteristics can be, can be different depending on how, it, on the lens that you're looking at the watershed through. So hydroweight gives that ability to, to kind of look at, at the landscape um, using the same response. So the water quality measurement is the same that we've taken here, but what's changed this time is that we're looking at different landscapes. Um, so for a couple of them, a couple of these ways of looking at the, at the landscape, the, the means haven't really changed very much, but when you start to look at the preferential flow paths in, in, this, uh, in this specific case is when you get very drastically uh, different numbers um, accounting for the hydrology in the system. So instead of disturbance uh, category, percent disturbance category one being 95%, so that would indicate that it's not very disturbed. And in, in a couple of the cases, it's actually more like 75% or 63%, uh, depending on the lens that you're looking through. Um, so it, that's a very high level, or I guess it's kind, kind of a high level way of looking at, at things, but really it can be broken down into asking yourselves these questions of you have this response variable, you have this predictor variable, and what is the, the um, what is the predictor pattern that you're trying to uh, to emulate? Like, are you trying? Are, do you expect that the that the process is is going to be a leaching process, or is it going to be kind of a straight line distance process? And then there's various decisions that you can make along the way to help you decide on on what might be the most appropriate uh, lens to look at that that watershed through. So. Um, I didn't really get into the nuts and bolts of the actual um, the actual tool, but it's it's an R package. It uses a cup, a little bit of external software, and there's a tutorial um, online hosted at um, GLFC Wet through GitHub, and um, and so I'd really encourage you to um, to have a glimpse at that. Um, you just have to have a little bit of experience with R, and the tutorials is pretty straightforward um, for getting those characteristics and, and weightings uh, down for your individual watersheds. So thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. You can stop sharing and then we'll get Matthew to put his presentation up. All right. I did stop sharing, right? Yes, looks good now. Okay. Looks good, Matthew. Thank you. Okay, you can see that. Okay, great. Yes. Uh so thanks for having me. Uh, those are two really interesting presentations and they kind of covered <laughs> some stuff I'm gonna talk about. So it's great because I can skip over some slides. Uh, so I'm gonna talk today a little bit about some data sources or data products that we have available uh, related to earth observation. And also a little bit uh, you know, uh, similar to what Brian was just talking about around geospatial modeling for kind of source water protection. And a lot of this relates to kind of the work that uh, students are doing in my lab. Um, so I'm definitely, and also some colleagues uh, with government and other, and other labs that we collaborate with. So one of the things that, that really struck me when I kind of watched the other webinars in, in kind of the series is that, you know, really we've gotten to this point now where mapping, uh, so I teach kind of GIS and remote sensing at UBC Okanagan, and it's great to see, but uh, we're getting to this point where mapping is kind of a part of most projects. So whether it's first water protection or planning or monitoring or, or trying to obtain funding, um, you know, mapping is kind of a part of most of it now. And a lot of that has to do with kind of the availability of geospatial data. So we often talk nowadays, and it's been this way for quite a while, but that we are very data rich. Um, a lot of this has to do with open data policies, and I'll talk about some new, or not really new data sets, but how much data we have available nowadays. A lot of this has to do with open data policies related to government, 
And this can be as simple as, you know, a map like this, where you're looking at, you know, what, um, what water supply, what water provider am I in? You know, if I'm trying to come up with some planning, it can be more complicated sort of outputs of derived models, like what, what type of aquifer or groundwater source uh, is located in the region. And also just, you know, simple land use planning. Um, like Jamie talked about, you know, most, most municipal governments and different levels of government now are hosting, you know, mapping portals that allow people to kind of interact with spatial data. So it's kind of taken away a little bit of, of not entirely, but it, it's taken away some of the, uh, the technical challenges of working with spatial data with some of these web mapping portals. And also we just have so much more GIS software now. Um, you know, there's obviously still like very big software companies like Esri who kind of dominate the market, but we have fantastic uh, open source GIS platforms now that are free, like QGIS or Quantum GIS, and also tools that are available as plugins that are con continuously being developed, like white box tools. So just an example, you know, of, of these mapping portals are things like, you know, the Okanagan flood story, for example, a portal that allows you to go in it, it hosts geospatial data that has been kind of formatted um, to allow you to interact with it. Some, some of these portals will allow you to kind of bring in new data sets, uh, but um, it's, it's, it's designed in a way that allows you to kind of map and explore the data. Uh, so these things can be really powerful for just kind of you know, engaging with stakeholders and using for other kind of purposes. But in our lab, so a few things I just want to kind of talk about, you know, where we are very data rich. And part of the part of the big part of the work in my lab is kind of when we're looking at watersheds, there's two things oftentimes that we're interested in, in understanding, especially when it comes to source water protection. And one of those things is kind of understanding risk. Like how do we understand what the risks are in the watershed? So what is kind of occurring in the watershed? Obviously we have a lot of watersheds that are, are uh, multi-stakeholder. There's a lot of different land uses in those watersheds, you know, just some examples. Uh, you know, forestry, oil and gas, agriculture, uh, road development to kind of support that, but also kind of natural disturbances, forest fire, mountain pine beetle, drought, all kinds of things that are going on in our watersheds. Like how, how do we understand that? So we're interested in understanding risk and then related to understanding risk, what is at risk in the watershed itself? Um, you know, lots of very good data sources available for kind of uh, stream networks, where stream networks are, are, are located, but, you know, in terms of wetland inventories, sensitive habitat for different kinds of species, whether that's fish or migratory birds, um, and also just understanding, you know, riparian habitat. And one of the key things that we're interested in with this is that this is all very dynamic. Our watersheds are changing continuously related to kind of, you know, resource extraction, natural disturbance, but also just how habitat changes over time. And so understanding risk, we need to understand how, what is at risk is changing also. So not only what disturbance is happening, but how risk is changing. So we have a lot, like I said, a lot of geospatial data that are available for this. And just as an example of how things are kind of dynamic and, and, and uh, like as an example, uh, sorry, just one second. Um, this is an example of a map that I see a lot of times. Um, it uses consolidated cut blocks that are provided by the BC government. So you can kind of see them on the, on the right there. Uh, and it gives the harvest here and, and it represents a polygon that's been harvested. And you can kind of see this is sort of five community watersheds in the Okanagan. And the proportion of the total area of the watershed or the landscape area of these watersheds that has been uh, logged from about 1924 to 2021 varies from about 12% to about 40%. So it's pretty high in some cases. When you go and you source this data, and it, it's, it's just kind of the way it is, but when you go source this data from the government, one of the things that they'll tell you is that, you know, anything within the last 10 years is somewhat reliable. Anything that is like 20 years old is sort of reliable and anything more than that, it's, you know, uh, they, it, it's a polygon essentially. And so, you know, th there are some issues that we have, this kind of pertains to all data, um, but you know, what is actually happening in the watershed? Are our data sources kind of representing that? And the other thing about when we kind of just look at like, 
all the polygons, let's say, that are harvested, we're kind of missing some of the processes that are going on. You know, obviously it's been harvested. The whole, the ecosystem is going to be a little bit different, but forests recover, you know, following fire, following kind of harvest, um, we get recovery happening. And so how can we understand that recovery and how those sort of ecosystem dynamics might influence like hydrology and other things in these watersheds? So the tools that we use in my lab a lot are related to earth observation. So, um, you know, primarily satellite remote sensing. So working with satellite data and Jamie already kind of gave this exact visualization. So it's perfect, but you know, these tools, like what you see here for this Google earth sort of uh, visualization of what's going on in the Okanagan represent a consolidation by Google of multiple data sources from all kinds of different satellites. This can be uh, open source satellites, and I'll give some examples of those in a second where the data are all free, and also some commercial platforms where you have to pay for the data. But the thing is that they, they allow you to visualize landscape change. And, and that's really useful for a lot of things, but oftentimes we're interested in digging a little bit deeper. So just a little crash course in, in kind of uh, Earth observation, satellite remote sensing. Um, you know, the big, the, when we're talking about the Earth observation with satellites, we're oftentimes talking about satellites that allow us to kind of monitor specifically kind of terrestrial or aquatic processes. So we're not really talking about like meteorology satellites or those kind of things, things that kind of provide data at, at scales, that allow us to kind of understand what's going on, you know, in a watershed, let's say. And the big player in this, or the big one that is used a lot in research is the Landsat uh, program. So this was a joint venture between NASA and USGS. It's the longest running earth observation mission uh, in the world with Landsat one being launched in 1972. Um, and now we are into Landsat nine, which was just launched in September 27, 2021. Uh, so this is a continuous legacy of, of repeat imagery that can be integrated from all the way from 1972-ish um, up to 2021, because there, there's been a lot of science that's gone into making sure that the sensors can kind of communicate with each other. Um, so what you can kind of see there with the, the, the colors are just like uh, the different sort of sensors that were on board the satellite. Uh, Landsat 5 is actually the longest running satellite uh, ever. Um, things didn't go so well for Landsat 6, but at the same time, kind of interspersed with this, within this, there are other missions. So, for example, the MODIS, the MODIS sensor in Terra and Apo is launched in 2000. Sentinel-1, which is synthetic aperture radar, launched in 2014. Sentinel-2, which is kind of similar to Landsat, launched in 2015. And the big shift, the huge thing that happened in 2008, was the decision to make all this data freely available, at least with Landsat. So we have access to multi, multi petabytes of data now. And it's just up to us to come up with ways to kind of use this data. So with Earth observation, it allows us, it provides us a platform for kind of looking at what's going on in watersheds. It could be change detection, it could be patterns of recovery. So here we have, for example, you know, forest fires occurring in Siberia and patterns of kind of deforestation, for example, that are going on, let's say, in the Amazon, uh, just as examples. So, you know, looking at fire, harvest, those kind of things. Other data products, like related to LIDAR, for example, uh, are also things that we'll use a lot. So on the left here, you have kind of what is considered, what's called a digital elevation model or a digital terrain model. And this is a 20 meter resolution, sort of a Canadian standard digital elevation model. What you can see on the right is the digital elevation model or uh, terrain model that's derived from LIDAR data that provides one meter resolution. And so this one meter resolution layer, you can kind of see provides a lot more information, information on geomorphology and terrain uh, that has huge implications on kind of you know, um, overland flow and other kind of hydrological processes. So Colleagues, uh, just to kind of show a few things uh, that we've been doing or that colleagues have been doing that we've been using in our research. Um, so colleagues at Natural Resources Canada, for example, have taken the entire Landsat time series for Canada to come up with that an individual pixel. So we're talking like 30 meters, 30 meter area, sorry, 900 meter square areas 
to come up with change detection algorithms to look at can we detect when change is happening, you know, for a little landscape unit that we can then kind of aggregate to, to uh, watersheds. And so what you can kind of see here on the left, and if you kind of look at this bottom, this bottom right panel, you can see sort of what we get with satellite imagery is sort of this trend of, of a landscape or a forest that has certain kind of spectral characteristics um, where nothing's really going on, it's a forest. And then all of a sudden, we're gonna get this abrupt shift, some kind of disturbance has happened. It could be, it could be fire, it could be harvest, just something has changed that spectral characteristic. So we can actually attribute when that happened. And then after the disturbances happen, we can look at how that change or recovery process is happening uh, for that individual pixel. So you can imagine doing this for all of Canada for forested areas, uh, it's a lot of data. So when we look at this, for example, we can start looking at, so when did disturbance happen for a specific pixel? And we can also attribute out then, you know, what disturbance type it was. Was it fire or was it harvest? And when we look at this um, in terms of processes of kind of disturbance and recovery, we start to see these sort of trends that we can, this is an example of some research we did in Alberta. We start to see these trends where we can sort of look at how watersheds are behaving over time. And so this is, this is an example in Alberta, but if you look at, for example, this really big uh, orange curve here, it represents watersheds that have been disturbed with huge fires that kind of you know, burned almost the entire area of the watershed. And then over time, we see a slow kind of recovery of these watersheds. Whereas the other sort of curves, for example, the ones in yellow are ones where we just see kind of this slow monotonic increase of forest harvest that's kind of going on in the watershed. So disturbance is one thing, but what's really exciting that colleagues are doing now is they're taking these disturbance histories and they're turning in, them into these temporal sort of uh, land cover data sets where we can look at how land cover is changing over time related to kind of landscape processes or disturbance processes that are happening in our watersheds. And so we can kind of see, uh, you know, this is an example um, and all this data are actually freely available. You can see on the left here, these sort of patterns of disturbance kind of accumulating over time. And on right, you can see how the land cover uh, in specific areas is sort of shifting from areas of mostly like coniferous to like mixed wood, uh, shrubs and other things. So we're actually in the process right now of looking at this specifically in each watershed in British Columbia to kind of understand how these changes in land cover are in, might influence hydrology kind of moving forward. So I'll just kind of briefly go over this, but the second thing, so once we understand some of the disturbance histories and kind of what's going on with, uh, with, um, uh, with land cover and change in our watersheds, the other thing that we're oftentimes interested in is what is at risk. Um, we have really good data on a lot of hydrological properties of hydrological systems like stream networks, for example, but there are some high, uh, you know, some some hydrological systems like wetlands uh, that that are you know require more inventory or require more monitoring. So I have a student right now who's actually working on a geospatial model, and this is very hot off the press. The model just kind of finished running two days ago, where she looked at, for example, how do we use these different sort of geospatial data products uh, or Earth observation products? So as input data. We then train the model based on different wetlands that we would expect to find in the Okanagan. And then we can actually predict for each individual kind of uh, 10 meter uh, pixel, what wetland class we might expect to find in those areas. So I'll just cycle through these really quickly, but anything that's really dark, dark purple is a low probability of being in this wetland class. And as it gets kind of towards yellow, it's a high probability. So this is just for like a little area. You can kind of see Fen here has very low probability. For marsh, we can start to identify individual areas that have a little bit higher. For open water, we just have kind of this one very discreet little area. For shallow water, again, it's kind of mixed, uh, pretty low. And then swamp, we have these individual pockets kind of distributed through this area. So this is really useful because it allows us to kind of probabilistically sort of uh, describe areas as being in a wetland class 
And since we know wetlands are somewhat ephemeral, they come and go, looking at it rather as just a polygon as more in terms of a probability can really help with monitoring. So I'll wrap this up. Um, you know, we've kind of gotten to this point where you know, we have a lot of data that's available to us. It's, it's incredible. Um, but things are still very data and processing intensive. And we still miss a lot of, uh, a lot of features. So things like roads and seismic lines are really hard to map using satellite data. Uh, data still come in a huge variety of formats, and they're really widely distributed across different platforms. So it can take a lot of work to pull it all together. But we have all these new computational platforms like Google Earth Engine and others that allow us to kind of manage these huge data sets. And I'd say one of the biggest things like in our work is that as we make data available, if we're looking at watersheds and what's going on for disturbances, it translates into all kinds of other stuff. So we do a lot of work, for example, with grizzly bears and understanding how their habitat is changing. Um, you know, we can do this while we're still looking at other sort of processes in the watershed. So thanks for your time. And uh, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you very much. If all the panelists could turn on their cameras. And we are at noon here, so we're a little bit behind schedule. And I don't see any questions in the Q&A. But if you do have a question in the audience, go ahead and type it in now. And I'm sure we could stick around for a minute or two. But if I don't see anything typed in there in the next 30 seconds or so, I'm going to say goodbye and let our panelists enjoy the rest of their day. Okay, I don't see anything. So thank you very much, Matthew, Brian, and Jamie. That was, those were excellent presentations. And I think the audience learned a lot from you. And again, this recording's available. Oh, there's something. Oh, somebody says, you mentioned grizzlies, but wasn't that a black bear, <laughs> Matthew? No, it is, it is a grizzly. Uh, <laughs> he's, his face is so close to the camera, it looks really distended. And when he's turned on his side, you can see the hump and stuff. And he actually just bit my camera right after that and wrecked it. So I'm pretty upset with him. <laughs> well, thank you for the clarification. I think that was James that yeah. asked that question. <laughs> okay, so thank you again, panelists, and hope to see uh, audience members next week for the monitoring and reporting webinar. And enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you.